It is the supplanting of a sacramental civilization with an anti-sacramental civilization. Um, so I think that's in essence what it is. It's it's not only it's not just private associations, but it's a it's a civilizational project to overturn the Christian order. Welcome back to another Miked Up, everybody. My name is David Gordon, and I'm your host. Today, we have the distinct honor of being joined by Mr. Joshua Charles, who is a former presidential speechwriter, uh, number one New York Times bestselling author. He's a scholar and a historian, and he's recently uh, served as editor for um, The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization, which was originally published in 1885, and it was authored by a Monsignor George Dillon. Thanks so much for being with us today, uh, Josh. We appreciate having you on. Thank you, David. Uh, like I told you before, uh, admirer of yours. And thank. And by the way, I was a White House speech writer. I was on the vice president side. So just to don't want to overinflate the resume. <laughs> I sure. appreciate it. <laughs> it, it. Very impressive, nevertheless. Um, thank you. So uh, the book by Monsignor Dillon is is it covers Freemasonry and the danger that it poses to the church and Christian civilization. Um, I, before, you know, we take it for granted in, in the Catholic circles, in Catholic media, that everybody really knows what Freemasonry is, what it's all about. Will, will you do my audience the kindness of just telling us what is Freemasonry and what is at its core, um, what, is it all, what, what it's all about and what are its goals? Well, I put Freemasonry and occultism in general in the same box. This is what Pope Leo XIII does. It's what Munson or Dillon does. Uh, there are all sorts of occult societies, secret societies and whatnot, who have had as their primary aim the overthrowing of Christendom, who go by all sorts of different names. And the Pope, uh, Leo XIII, uh, you know, uses Freemasonry as a catch-all for this. So what is it in brief? Uh, I guess you could say it is the resurrection of the pagan mystery system that wants to uh, defeat the Christian mystery system. That is to say, the sacramental system of the Catholic Church. And its ultimate goal is to separate nature from grace, uh, nature from the supernature that is required to, you know, attain our final end, eternal beatitude with God in heaven. And so it is the supplanting of a sacramental civilization with an anti-sacramental civilization. Um, so I think that's in essence what it is. It's, it's not only, it's not just private associations, but it's a, it's a civilizational project to overturn the Christian order. You know, that's really interesting because I think a lot of people really just think that this is, uh, these are societies where men can kind of gather together and enjoy fellowship and maybe even do some uh, humanitarian projects every once in a while. But are you telling me that it's always the case that at least at the core of these groups, these Masonic groups, that there's kind of a credo that bonds them together, and it's not just simply men enjoying fellowship, enjoying fellowship and fraternity? Well, we have to distinguish between the average Freemason, uh, especially today. Uh, you know, we're in a post-Christendom society. We're in, uh, I would say, a, a Western civilization that has become full-on apostate. That was not totally the case just yet when Monsignor Dillon was writing. And we do know that the popes, when they were, well, they're still a temporal sovereignty. You know, they're still a monarch in the Vatican City. But when they had the papal states, there were many plots to overturn the papal states, overturn other thrones and altars, so to speak, in Europe. Uh, and, the, and the papacy came into uh, possession of many, many documents that... Uh, to this day, we don't have all of them, certainly not translated. And so when, when they're referring to Freemasonry in general, it really is, it, it's much bigger than just, you know, sort of the Eagles Club Freemason groups that people think about today. Um, and frankly, many of the lower members, Monster Dillon and Pope Leo XIII both make this point. Many of the lower level members don't even realize what they're involved in. Um, they're not initiated into the higher level uh, plot, I guess you could say. Um, many of these groups started with welcoming Catholics, um, and, and that was unclear to the average Catholic what, in fact, they were getting involved in, which is why the church's pastoral voice was so frequently raised against it and to this day you know, prohibits Masonic membership in canon law. And so, um, 
Yeah, it's it's much much more than just you know a bunch of nice guys uh, engaged in fraternal projects. I was just on, as I told you before, I was on with David Gray, who is a who's a Catholic and a former Mason. Um, I think a, a point I made to him that I think is worth mentioning is, uh, as I said, the the Masonic and occult project is fundamentally it's civilizational in scope, and it's fundamentally related to severing the natural from the supernatural. And the philosophical, theological basis for this, uh, Pope Leo XIII calls it naturalism. Uh, again, the idea that nature is sufficient to attain its own end. Um, and the name I gave it, you know, I came from a Protestant background, came into the church in 2019. And so, the, you know, a variety of the Protestant uh, heresies were described in terms of sola fide, sola scriptura, things of that sort. So I am describing this as sola natura, nature alone. And I think it goes right back to the garden. And uh, there's even Masonic writings that 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 say that Masonry and the Catholic Church began being the prime enemies of one another from you know the primeval origins of man. Right. Well, and, let me stop you there because this yeah. is an interesting paradox that we run into here because it seems like Freemasonry rejects the supernatural. At the same time, it kind of looks to the supernatural, especially supernatural revelation, i.e. scripture, the book of Genesis, as its source, as its font, as its provenance. And that seems to be at least in, in internal tension, if not an internal contradiction that's insurmountable. How, how would they respond to that? Do they believe in God and uh, just reject him? Or do they disbelieve in God in favor of this enlightenment uh, sola natura, as you say? Well, I won't presume to speak for every person who identifies as a Freemason. I, when I'm talking about Freemasonry, I'm talking about what its essence is sure, and what its core is, as, as described by the popes and, and the Monsignor Dillon. Right, I mean uh, like the minds of the founders of, of yeah. Freemasonry and really, the yeah, the nucleus, guy. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think, I, well, Pope Leo XIII, we, you know, in the back of the book, uh, you know, we, we lay out in the, in the description basically, well, let me give a little bit of background. I read this book in the during the lockdowns of 2020, you know, that very uneventful period. And it was... It was my first Easter as a Catholic, actually. So that was that was even more interesting. Um, oh, f first Easter as a Catholic, the first uh, cessation of the public celebration of the Mass at Easter since the Diocletian <laughs> persecution. That was that was fascinating. What a disaster! Anyway, so, yeah. So I'm re yeah. So I'm reading this book, and it's describing this agenda, and you know the things we describe in the in the description, and it's what Monsignor Dillon goes to, into in great detail. The destruction of the temporal and the spiritual power of the papacy, the uh, civilizing of divorce, meaning easy divorce laws, making m marriage a civil, purely civil contract, you know, no-fault divorce, etc. Uh, totally secularized education, uh, total separation of church and state, uh, morally depraving the population. Uh, now, why? It's very interesting. Pope Leo XIII and Monsignor Dillon both say that this is because when the plot reaches its final climax, the population will be all the more willing to go along with it. Um, because when you've been trained to will contrary to your intellect, then you become you know, a, a far easier person to make into a coward, essentially. Well, yeah, I think uh, we see that right now. Um, you know, yeah. in the book of Revelation, uh, the apocalypse, they're always talking about, you know, there'll be these like terrible plagues and, you know, uh, a third of the population was killed off due to disease or pestilence or like a meteorite uh, hitting the earth. And yet the people still will not repent. It's because their yeah. will and their intellect are at war and they love what's evil and they hate what's good. Yeah, anytime we will, contrary to what our intellect knows or should know, we, we literally become a split personality, you know? And it's why I think a lot of people these days, I mean, in general, this is a human condition, right? Our Adam and Eve hid from God, so they were insecure too. All of us have an insecurity, but especially these days, I think we're just in a, in a time period where the what we do know or should know with our intellects is so divorced from what we're actually doing I think it's, you know, we have a highly insecure society. I think that's the reason why. The the final part that Leo XIII and uh, Dylan describe is um, that it's all animated by a socialistic, communistic uh, form of uh, ideology that will end in pantheism, nature worship. So this comes back to your original question about, well, they believe in God. Uh, yeah, Masons are required to, quote, believe in God. Who and what this God is becomes clearer in the higher grades, I would say. I'm not a Freemason. I was. At, they tried to recruit me on occasion. You know, Freemasons never tell you, "Hey, will you join the Freemasons?" They want you to ask. 
because by you asking, there's already an investment of your will, really. And so, but at the higher grades, um, uh, they are, this is what they're animated by. So do they reject the supernatural in terms of the divine? No. I, but I would say it's not supernatural for them. It's, I guess you could say, I'm literally, you know, kind of thinking off the top of my head. I think it'd be intra-natural, meaning the divine is somehow latent within nature itself. But then and why so are they it's not a denial of divinity. It's just a it's just an identification of it as not external to the creature, but ultimately inside the creature to be accessed by a sort of gnosis and knowledge. You know, it, it, this is why it literally goes back to the tree. You know, when Satan says to says to Eve, you know, you shall be as gods if you if you consume the tree of the, of the fruit of the knowledge of uh, good and evil. Um, what's implicit in that? What's implicit in that? is that there is a divinity that can be accessed through this particular gnosis, this knowledge of the of good and evil. And um, so it, it's I would argue it's it's the sola natura idea is right there. And we know from St. Thomas Aquinas, he describes Satan's fall. And what was the essence of Satan's fall? Satan wanted to partake of the beatific vision without grace. He wanted it to be by virtue of his angelic nature alone. And this was aggravated by the fact that he knew that the uncreated God who is being itself would assume human nature, which is a lower nature, physical, than, than, than the spiritual angelic. And so he was disgusted by this. And so it was a sort of spiritual racism and xenophobia. And so, but we know for a fact that Satan wanted to partake, well, through St. Thomas, who I assume is just factual, unless shown otherwise. Um, but we know that Satan wanted to partake of the beatific vision without grace, without right. without participation in the divine nature. He wanted it to be sufficient in his nature. And so that's that's literally been his ploy from the beginning. It's what's behind all of masonry, all of occultism. And and a point I made to David Gray, a former Mason himself who's now Catholic, I think this is very important. It's very easy to be a Satanist. Uh, we it, All of us, in, a, in one form or another, partake of a form of Satanism every time we choose to, especially mortally sin, but really any sin. Um, you know, for Satanism and occultism to overtake society doesn't require something as overtly creepy as drag queens and the Grammy show we just witnessed a few weeks or months ago. Um, I don't watch these things, but I, I see I see them all over. Yeah, you'll see it in the news or whatever. We're not yeah, personally yeah. witnessing it, but I read but a news need, story and I was aghast. <laughs> yeah, you just you just need people who think that they are self sufficient for attaining their final end, which is most everybody. In okay, our but. Here's where I would proffer an objection, or at least, again, Please. recur to the difficulty that I'd raised previously. I believe Dylan says that essentially uh, Masons take for granted that the tree of knowledge is the tree of life, which kind of is a yes. way of encapsulating what you were saying. But these very things themselves are products of divine revelation in the Jewish and Christian holy books, in Genesis, right? So it's like we're going to the source, which is itself divinely revealed in order to adopt a, an ideology that rejects God. So there's a tension there. And this is what got me thinking. And maybe you can speak to this, and you kind of just did in a way, but it's very Luciferian in the sense that it's almost starting from the point that, yeah, God exists, and there is this revelation to mankind, but we reject the, the message of the revelation even though we know it's true, which is almost the most satanical that something can get. It, am I wrong? Am I missing something? No, I mean, I mean, we we know as Catholics that evil doesn't have its own substantive existence. It leeches off of it leeches off of that which does exist, and that which does exist is um, by its own nature good, because everything that God created is good. So, and evil is just a deprivation of that good. So, I don't think they need to believe that Genesis and whatnot is a divine revelation per se. I think they can see it as you know part of this gnosis that's been trans you know transferred down the ages which they have the key to understanding. Sure. Uh, so I don't think they need to see it as a divine revelation in the sense that you and I do. You and I see it as the, the external, uncreated creator who is divinity, who, who is subsistent being, revealing to us as creatures who are contingent, who are, you know, uh, what was it, St. Teresa of Avila who was talking to our Lord, and he said, I am he who is, you are she who is not. You know, we are not without God loving us into existence. And so... We accept scripture as this uncreated creator reaching down to the created contingent creature. 
Um, they don't, but I don't think they need to see it that way to, to twist it in the way you're saying. So yeah, I think it's compatible with what you said. Okay, so let me ask this. I mean, and again, you spoke to this, you touched on it briefly uh, right when we jumped into the show. But looking through all of the, the writings of Pope Leo XIII and all the times he's quoting or referencing the, the Freemason program against the church, Freemasons really hate the Catholic Church. I mean, they abhor it. They loathe it. Yep. Why do Freemasons hate the church so much? It's like, we never did anything to you guys. Um, and that's a really simplistic way of putting it, but it, there is definitely some spiritual combat going on here. What is oh, yeah. that? Well, there's many, there's many potential answers to that. Here's one, one uh, direction I'll take. Um, if implicit in your ideology and philosophy and theology and whatnot is that the divinity is latent within nature itself, then there's no higher presumption than a church that claims to have the authority to bind your conscience. And this is why I think so much of the fall of Christendom, you know, really begins with the so-called Reformation, uh, which I was a child of and left. Um, and so uh, it's this assertion of, uh, of the, of the um, sufficiency of the individual conscience to reach, you know, the, the highest truths, which we don't accept. I mean, the whole Christian faith breaks down if that's, if that's true, if the if the individual conscience is, you don't need apostles. What do you need apostles to announce a gospel for? What do you need a church with the power to bind and loose for? Um, all of these things become um, tyrannical usurpations. And in fact, whenever you read Masonic texts, it's very clear that they, and this would go into the eschatological topic if we'd want to, because I, I think there's very clear scriptural and patristic bases for um, seeing the same reality that the Masons do and occultists do, but, but obviously in a totally different way. But essentially, they see the Catholic Church as having suppressed the old pagan mystery system and restrained it, and in doing so, um, you know, uh, slowing down uh, humanity's progress toward enlightenment. And, and so that's why they want to overthrow it. And uh, again, it, it all comes down to separating nature from supernature, separating nature from grace. We as Catholics, you know, as a Protestant, I thought Catholics were all about, you know, earning their way to salvation and whatnot. I mean, nothing can be further from the truth, you know. Um, we, we are not Pelagians. We believe we need grace to be healed. We believe that without grace, our intellects will remain unenlightened and our wills are, will remain uh, weak. And both are, both are still weak even with grace in many ways. I don't know about you, but that's certainly true of me. But, um, but yeah, it, 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 that, that, it really does come down to the Catholic Church's... Um, uh, you know, uh, arrogance to claim that it has the authority from God to bind the consciences of men and to authoritatively teach uh, morals and dogma. Sure. No, great, great answer. Um, I, I want to pivot real fast because... There's other one, threads to that, but that would be a very important one. Sure. Of course. Um, I, you know, if one believes, and I, I think one of the sad things that we're seeing in, in modern times is the ascent in some more radical traditionalist circles of a kind of anti-Semitism. And um, mm. that a lot of the onus and the blame for the ascent of Freemasonry has been put on the Jews. But I don't think that's fair reading through Dylan's work here. It looks like one of the, the main causes um, for the ascent of Freemasonry was, in fact, Protestantism, which you just alluded to. And in fact, it looks like the godfathers of Freemasonry, uh, God's, guys like Faustus Sakinus and Voltaire, were, in fact, bad Catholics. Um, yeah. Can you speak to that? What, is, what do you think is the, the, the cause for the ascent of Freemasonry? So, so you want me to talk about the Jews, David? So this is, you know, you always just send me the curveballs here. Or, I'm sorry, the softballs. Um, no, uh, there's actually a little bit in the at the beginning where, you know, I note that Monsignor Dillon does mention Jewish aspects to Freemasonry. Um, I think that's undeniable. Uh, you just read some of the Masonic texts. There is an incorporation of Hebrew and what, but there's an incorporation of a lot of things, you know. And so I note that, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to say, what can I say publicly? Let's just say that, you know, I think there was a consideration to, well, should we include those parts where Monsignor Dillon says some negative things about Jews? Because, you know, I have many dear Jewish friends. 
uh, love them to death, and uh, I, I hopefully I hope I would die if they were being persecuted, you know, for their sake. Absolutely. Um, and so, so, but I, I felt in the interest of historical fidelity that those portions where he says those things should be included. And the reason why I stated was because I don't think he was animated by any, uh, certainly not ethnic or religious hatred. And he mentions many other uh, nationalities that are involved. I mean, you said Voltaire. I mean, he says Lord Palmerston, a mid-19th century United Kingdom prime minister, was likely the head of this secret organized atheism in the world. And, you know, these are not Jews. And right. So, it seems like fallen away Christians were at the heart yeah. of this. And, it, you know, reading his text, I think Dylan does a fair treatment in some regards because he actually says, you know, it was because of Protestantism um, in part and the downfall of Catholic architecture that Freemasons had to kind of expand their base um, whereas before it was very insular, and then they had to expand and they let in more people, and that's really when, uh, you know, there was a greater influence from Judaism. But at first it seems very, very uh, much to be secularized Christians and Catholics. Yeah, you know, um, I am not, just to be frank, I'm not particularly interested in the Jewish angle. I'm interested in what wants to separate my human nature from grace. Uh, and I think that's the main thing. Um, you know, I I do think there are two extremes in the church today. One of them is that if you mention Freemasonry or occultism and whatnot, you're automatically engaged in a sort of tinfoil hat conspiracy theorizing, uh, it, which people are fine. They can claim that. Um, but if they're going to claim that, they need to be also comfortable with the with the claim that must go with that, and that is that numerous supreme pontiffs of the Catholic Church were tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists, which, if they're willing to do that, fine, they're consistent. If they're not, then they're not. The other extreme is, uh, like I say in the book, is finding Freemasons under every rock, and yes, I have seen some of the things you say about people putting that all with Jews, you know, yeah, Judas was a Jew, but primarily he was a follower of Christ who fell. Um, I mean, the Council of Trent in the Roman Catechism says that Christians bear more responsibility for uh, for choosing to sin than even Jews do because we accept Christ's message. Sure. Um, and in knowing Christ's message and choosing to sin, we are more responsible for his crucifixion than than Jews. And so so this is the Council of Trent. That's the 16th century, you know. So um, there, there's some myths on this front about, about the church's disposition toward Jews. You didn't say any of this, but... But, uh, you know, that uh, a Jewish colleague of mine in Israel, we were working on, you know, studying all sorts of sources related to this. And we were both of us were shocked at, sure. at the number of times popes were defending Jews and and whatnot. But but, yeah, there's many different elements involved in the whole Freemasonry occultism. And I personally don't find anything helpful. In fact, much more likely to be unhelpful to to make it, you know. Uh, ethnocentric. Well, I was just struck by the fact, by the degree of responsibility that lapsed Christians and Catholics had for this. Uh, yeah, but I don't want to get too bogged down in that. I, I've got to confess that before I looked at Dylan's book, you know, I, I always knew Freemasonry was real and that a Catholic couldn't be a Freemason, but I always thought aired on the side of, oh, this is very sensational. And, you know, a lot of what's plaguing the church, a lot of the dangers to the church are just more quotidian, regular uh, sins and sinners, you know, fallen human nature, people choosing to act in accord with their concupiscence rather than choose for virtue. And of course, that's true. And, you know, not every struggle in the Christian life is going to be some grand struggle between Freemasonry um, no. on the one hand and the church on the other hand, but they will be internal struggles. That said, I, find, I found myself blushing a little bit as I looked through the book and saw the strength of the case that Dylan makes that many of the bad ideas um, that would ultimately end up plaguing modern society do have their origin in Freemasonic ideology. Uh, can you tell us, what was their program? What did, in a practical way, what did the Freemasons want and how successful have they been in accomplishing their agenda? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll emphasize a point I made at the beginning is that not everybody, not every group in question uh, that, that Dylan or Pope Leo XIII includes in, in Freemasonry, their term for Freemasonry, necessarily goes by the term Freemason. So, you know, uh, Dylan talks about the Carbonari and the Alta Vendita. You know, these were Italian occult groups that 
are included under the Leonine, you know, Pope Leo XIII uh, rubric of Freemasonry, but didn't necessarily call themselves Freemasons. So that's that's point number one. Um, point number two, you know, I think I might have mentioned earlier, but you know, destruction of the of the temporal authority of the Pope, which was achieved in 1870, uh, consummated in 1929 in some ways uh, with the Lateran Treaty. Um, you know, I personally, I think the the uh, the uh, giving up of the tiara by Paul, Pope Paul VI was probably, a, you know, a troubling aspect of this as well. Um, and so destroying the spiritual authority of the papacy, I mean, Leo XIII says that these occult groups are not going to stop until they, they destroy everything that the popes have established for the sake of religion. So, I mean, Leo XIII says this on multiple occasions. Um, as I said earlier, the total secularization of education, uh, easy divorce laws, uh, morally corrupting the population. All these things, I think, really do have to do. The essence is separating nature from supernature, separating nature from grace. And so it's destroying the, um, the supernatural character of these things. So when you make you know, marriage a matter of a contract that can be broken even more easily than a business contract, such as no-fault divorce does, um, you, have, you have robbed it. You have uh, deprived it of its supernatural character. Um, and unfortunately, this was another aspect in which Protestantism played a huge role. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've studied a lot of American history, written some books on the Founding Fathers. You know, William Bradford, in his history of uh, the Plymouth Colony, he talks about how they put marriage under the jurisdiction of the civil magistrate and basically brags about this. That it's a good thing. It's so obviously true and against those, you know, those Romanists and whatnot. But so, so the, the separating of the, the institution of marriage from its supernatural character was already well underway with Protestantism um, and the denial of, it, of, of, of one of the seven sacraments, in addition to you know, denying many of the other sacraments. And, so, and then we see that throughout American history, marriage has fundamentally been under the jurisdiction of the state, and we see where that's gotten us. <laughs> so, so there's, so, and here's the thing, is when nature is separated from supernature, when nature is separated from grace, uh, as we said earlier, the intellect is incapable of recognizing truth. Um, and the will is not capable of following it. So as I talk about in the introduction, um, this is where the separation of church and state comes in. Because the, the church has always taught that if the power of the state is not submitted to the authority of the church, then the state will not be capable of really um, achieving its purpose, which is temporal. The state does not get us to heaven, right? But legislating in such a way that the community as a whole and individuals within it are... are um, the way is cleared, so to speak, for them to attain their final end, which is beatitude in heaven. Sure, that's and the two swords theory that you reference yeah. from Leo the Thirteenth in your introduction to the work. Well, it starts very. It starts, you know, I'm sure you know this, but it starts far earlier than Leo the Thirteenth. Of course. But, um, but uh, you know, Pope on um, Galatius uh, in his letter to Emperor Anastasius, he he uses different Latin terms. He uses potestas, power, for the state, and he uses. Uh, Octoritas, authority for the church. And so think about the situation we're in now is where we have temporal powers that really do see themselves as self-sufficient and de auto-defining. You know, it, it, the age of, uh, of um, what did, uh, uh, well, Pope Benedict at the time, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, the dictatorship of relativism. I mean, this is what, this is the temporal power that has completely and totally divorced itself from the spiritual authority of the church. And, and so, again, it's always the separation of nature from grace. It is the fundamental, uh, not just Masonic, but uh, Satanic uh, plot. It's, it's what it's been from the garden. It's what it's been now. And one of the reasons I think we're in particularly perilous times is I do think um, we're reaching a, a sort of climax. And we're seeing things, and I mean, you and I are probably similar ages. I just turned 35. Yeah, um, I'm 36 right now. Okay. So we're basically the same age. Um, we grew up in the George W. Bush era and whatnot. I mean, it's a fundamentally different country from even when we were growing up. Now, you grew up Catholic, so you were perhaps aware of it more than I was as an evangelical Protestant. You know, the country was hardly perfect. That's not my claim. But, um, but even in the last 10, 15 years, I don't recognize what's going on in the country. They're I always tell my kids that. Like, look, this is a different America than even when I grew up in. And, yeah. like, I'm not an old dad, you know? No. Uh, it's, it's completely different. And certain privileges that I even had, you won't enjoy because of how marked the changes have been to uh, America and the West in general. Yeah, yeah. And so... 
we don't have to get into the eschatological element. I mean, Monsignor Dillon does. He he claims that there is a secret directory that controls, centrally controls all or most of the secret societies on earth that are trying to supplant Christendom and put, frankly, a restoration of what came before the incarnation of our Lord in its place. And right. so um, he claims this. He gives all sorts of fascinating insights into how it does that. But he does claim, you know, there's sort of a dark apostolic succession uh, in, in Freemasonry that he claims, um, where the, the head of this secret directory, whose identity is known to very few, will ultimately be Antichrist, that the final head of this will be Antichrist, and he'll be revealed to the world. And, um, and uh, you know, St. Paul talks in Second Thessalonians 2 about a great apostasy that will precede the coming of Antichrist. This is a topic I've lectured on, been researching a lot, so it could be a whole other discussion. But I guess the short version would be is I do think, you know, in Second Thessalonians 2, St. Paul calls Antichrist the man of lawlessness. And so to me, I thought, okay, well, studying from the fathers of Scripture, trying to figure this all out. But the first question that, that comes to mind is, well, what is the church always taught as a source of lawfulness? And it's the two powers. It's the temporal power, which Paul tells us in Romans 13, has the sword for, you know, uh, upholding justice and fighting iniquity. And then the spiritual power of the church. And so those are the sources of lawfulness, you know, the sacraments and whatnot. And so um, I do believe that part of the essence of the great apostasy is the, the rebellion of the temporal uh, from the spiritual, which is actually something uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says in, uh, in his commentary in Second Thessalonians. He says that it will be a mass, essentially, rebellion against the authority of the Roman church. Right. So, uh, I, I do want to get into that eschatological dimension in a second. For right now, though, I just want to focus because it seems like there's a, a buildup. It goes from kind of simple to complex here. Where, where first, on the way to this complete divorce of the two swords, of uh, the spiritual authority from the temporal authority, you know, there, there's kind of a plan of attack that Freemasons have. And that's why, and Dylan alludes to this in the book, um, you know, they're really good at building coalitions. He says, you know, they would be all for communists and socialists and, you yeah. know, the Enlightenment values uh, kind of working in tandem, even if in like a hidden way. I kind of picture like a Spectre-esque James Bond organization directing all these independent people uh, to kind of Davos focus. Or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Blofeld. Um, <laughs> And that's what it seems like to me. What is the political platform of Freemasons? What are they trying to do on the secular political level? Uh, it, we know they're trying to get rid of the authority of the church, the spiritual authority of the church, and ultimately to destroy Holy Mother Church. But at, at the level of the state, what is their plan? And, and yes, we do have extensive quotations um, in the book from Leo the Thirteenth about how they're trying to co-opt children from the parents and get involved uh, in in educating kids, and we see that happening now. And obviously, uh, with divorce laws, um, you know, loosening divorce, making it a civil contract, as by the way, first wave feminists wanted to do, like Susan B. Anthony, you know, they wanted easier divorce laws. So we see a lot of this happening, and obviously, California became a no-fault divorce state. Um, yeah. after, at, after at the, the Soviet of Union. Reagan. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what is like the broader political platform of the Freemasons at the secular state level? Well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the root word of diabolical means to separate. That's right. And, and so, um, okay, good. I, I was like, oh man, is this right or not? <laughs> um, but, but I think that's it. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, George Washington had a Masonic ritual in which he consecrated, you know, a dark consecration, the, the capital cornerstone. Uh, we don't know where that cornerstone is to this day, but this is a, this is a tested fact. It's on the, you know, historian of the Capitol's uh, website. Um, and this ritual was reenacted in 2018. You can find it on C-SPAN. It's and it's very creepy. It's very creepy. But one of the senators there, I think it was Mike Enzi. He he's you know he claims he's a you know high level Freemason. He was a mayor of some town in Wyoming, whatnot. And he said, I would always try and get the Freemasons to come and you know dedicate all the cornerstones of our new public buildings. And so um, uh, you know again, this really did begin with Protestantism. You know, I, I'm I'm finishing up writing another book right now with some friends. 
uh, where it'll be with Sophia Stupress. It, it's called Persecuted from Within, How the Saints Endured Crises in the Church. We thought that seemed relevant. And, um, you know, I, I'm covering saints like St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More. So I've been doing more research on the whole Henry VIII thing. But even with Luther, the whole the whole game was to get the temporal power on your side. That was the whole game, because then you 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 institute this sort of Erastian setup where where the the religion of the prince becomes the religion of the people, and so it's the same thing now. I I you know as you know, there's many different elements of what you're talking about. So I I don't know. It might be too broad for me to get, you know, unless there's a more specific question. But um, but yeah, uh, you know, Saint Pope Gregory the Great in his Morale on Job, he has a whole lot of eschatological reflection. It's actually quite profound. Uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas said Pope Gregory's uh, mystical reflection on Job was the single best out there. So so even Saint Thomas uh, only stuck to the moral uh, commentary on Job. He didn't even do the mystical. He was like Pope Gregory did it. I can't I can't get higher than that. And in that um, reflection, Pope, Saint Pope Gregory the Great says that. Um, by the end, the church will be severely weakened by the time the Antichrist arrives. And it says that Satan will have garnered to himself extraordinary temporal power with which to persecute the church. So, again, it's all about getting the temporal power. And if it's sola natura, nature alone, naturalism, it's all about the temporal power acting as if it is sufficient unto itself. It becomes auto-defining, you know. Would it, you say that it's really important then, like the First Amendment jurisprudence that we have, where, um, you know, the gov Congress not making a law that will inhibit religion or mandate an official state church has become basically separation of church and state, and you cannot have religion in the public sphere at all, even at the state level. Obviously, the First Amendment originally before incorporation was strictly directed at the federal government. It didn't speak to the states, and in fact, at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, many states had official religions. Would you say that that's an important part of the Masonic plan to kind of uh, create fertile soil for for these final battles between God and the Antichrist at the eschaton. Well, again, Dave, you just you just throw me the the smallest subjects, you know. So <laughs> I so <laughs> I'm actually working on another book on that topic with uh, Dr. Scott Hahn. Uh, we'll be analyzing my the former founding. professor. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Uh, I, I'm. I'm I'm deeply honored and humbled that I get to work on something with Scott Hahn, but. Um, but yeah, we're going to analyze the founding from a Catholic perspective. Um, I can talk about this some other time, but uh, your brother has written some good things on this. I don't agree with him on everything, but he's written some good things on this. Um, I think, um, let's just put it this way. I think the First Amendment was a Protestant solution to a Protestant problem. And could anything better have been done in the context? Probably not. Um, you know, and so for that sake, the virtue of prudence could could have a Catholic accept that for what it is. You know, there were centuries where Catholics didn't have established authority of any kind. And so the church does not need the temporal power. But it is also true that the United States was the first uh, polity in the Western world post-Constantine that had no formal connection with religion. Um, that's a big problem, in my in my opinion. There's There's much to admire about the founding. There's also some severe criticisms. It's a huge topic. Um, I would simply say I, there's a quote that will kind of serve as the basis for our thesis in the book. It comes from Justice Joseph Story. And Joseph Story was a Supreme Court justice. I believe he was Unitarian. Um, so, you know, an Aryan. <laughs> and, um, and so Joseph Story wrote, a co wrote commentaries on the Constitution. I believe this was from 1833 or something. And he talked about the First Amendment. And he didn't want an established church or anything of that sort. But he also said the First Amendment wasn't intended to be anti-Christian in any way. Um, but he said nothing like the First Amendment has been done in human history. Even pagan powers didn't separate religion from the polity. No Western uh, uh, nation or empire had done that, even the Protestant ones. Um, and so he said, this is a new experiment, and the experience of the American states will be decisive in determining whether or not it's a, it's a, it's a um, valid political principle. Sure. So he does say that. And, and the last thing I'll say on this um, is that this is part of the reason there's a Catholic Church, uh, meaning 
people oftentimes don't realize that when they when they propose proposition X, they think proposition X is all they're believing. Whereas the Catholic Church will say, no, embedded in proposition X is all sorts of implicit ideas that you're not grappling with. This was true with Protestantism. I think Luther would be horrified by all the sects and whatnot that have proliferated. And I don't think Luther was a good guy by any stretch. But I think he would be horrified. Calvin would be horrified. But they were they were bad philosophers. And likewise, the founding fathers, I don't think most of them, didn't have an explicit idea of let's separate Christianity from the polity. I think many of them believe quite differently from that. But because they were bad philosophers, because they didn't have a particularly good knowledge of the human soul and how it works, what's it, what its final end is and whatnot, um, they implemented all sorts of things that were not conducive to the good of that soul. Yeah, and no, so, it's, it's a preposterous thing. The word culture comes from cult, comes cult, from the yeah. word for religion, because religion is so intrinsically formative of culture. So would it be fair well, to they, say well, then... Let me say one more thing. Really, sure. religion is if if you wanted to think of it, you know, religion. The virtue of religion is you know worshiping God in the manner He is appointed, right? So that's obviously only the Catholic faith. But if we wanted to make a more generalized definition of religion, religion is essentially um, that worldview by which a, a, a society understands the highest goods. Right. And every society is going to have that. And so I think what's encouraging about the day we're in now is more and more people are realizing that, that the, um, the modern project has, a, has an incoherence at the very heart of it. Now, that's a little scary, too, because I, I frankly think many of the proposed solutions aren't going to work. I do think Christendom's done. I think the signs of the times are that it's not coming back. That's my personal opinion. Um, that's not your saying, call from, it, from Vatican II, though. Read the signs of the times. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think many people are realizing this problem. But yeah, every society is going to have a, a, a sort of idea of, of what it considers transcendent to the society. Right now, um, you could call it, you know, narcissistic deism of some kind, I guess. You, could, you know, moral therapeutic deism was the, was the term Philip Reef, I think was his name, came up with. But it, it's, it's beyond moral therapeutic deism now. It, it's, it's pure, you know, demonic, atomized individualism that must be worshipped as if it's a god or something you know right. individualistic so, yeah. voluntarism so sure. let me ask that you works. if it's um is it a fair assessment because i'm really trying to pin this down uh and just to put put the cap on this um is it a fair assessment to say that the masonic political platform is really to separate and in the realm of governance the natural law from the positive law you know, that's very interesting because there's elements of Freemasonry when you read them that are very consonant with the natural law in theory. But again, I think because of its naturalism, because of sola natura, it doesn't recognize that nature is incapable of perfectly perceiving, let alone following the natural law. We, our nature does need to be repaired. But I think, again... Um, I think you could say the political program of Freemasonry is desacralization. You know, there's been a, and I don't claim to fully understand this as well as someone like, you know, D.C. Schindler or something. He's written some really good books like The, the Politics of the Real and whatnot. But uh, prior to the so-called Enlightenment, you know, nature itself was seen in the context of pointing to the transcendent. So when you saw nature... Um, you didn't see it in a univocal sense with the divine, as if God and nature share the same, you know, plane of being, I guess you could say. But but nature pointed to the divine. Nature pointed to that which was beyond itself. As a with canvas the, points to an artist, right. Yeah, and so, but with enlightenment, the view of nature changes. The Nature becomes this sort of mechanistic thing that no longer points to the transcendent. It is It is this thing to be manipulated for the sake of human ends, by the power of reason. And so I think that's what our politics has become. Uh, I think that's what our science, I, I, I also think this is why we're having rampant irrationalism with the transgender movement, for example, while at the same time, our scientific knowledge and technological prowess is, you know, we're seeing with AI especially is, is increasing by leaps and bounds. It's, it's a, it's a desacralized view of nature that increases our power over it, even while we remain, you know, moral, 
Lilliputians, you know? Sure. Um, I we do want to... extend to insanity and irrationalism without grace, so... So pivoting now towards more of the eschatological, what is the obsession that Freemasons have with the temple, rebuilding the temple? And um, especially, you know, we know as Christians that Christ is the true third temple um, that, yeah. that was rebuilt in, in three days. But it seems like, and this is where there's uh, a nexus with Scripture, is that there's going to be the temple rebuilt and this is part of the Freemasonic program, and it's in that temple that the Antichrist will declare himself to be God? Yeah, there's various theories about that, but I'll, I'll lay out my, um, my rough theory right now. I've lectured on it uh, more in depth uh, a few months ago at a Catholic online conference called uh, Proclamation of the Kingdom. Uh, Edward Habsburg was participating, so really good people there. But... Um, so let's go to Second Thessalonians again. Uh, Paul says that prior, he's trying to tell people, you know, Antichrist is not about to arrive or whatever, and here's why these things need to happen first. And he says that Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, will arrive after the what he calls the catacon, the restrainer, is no longer restraining. Uh, St. Paul refers to this catacon in the neuter, uh, neuter it and then the singular he. Um, I have uh, a lot of details on this, so I, I'll, I'll make it brief. But my essentially, my theory is that the catacomb is Christendom itself, preeminently uh, represented by the Pope and the papacy. Um, and so there will be something about the, the church and Christendom that will no longer restrain. And at that moment, or in that epoch, uh, Antichrist will appear. Um, the man of lawlessness will have been allowed temporarily to overcome the source of lawfulness that God has established in the world. And I think we see this in multiple places in Scripture. I propose a hermeneutic in the lecture I gave of restrain, release, return. And you see this in multiple places in Scripture. So, for example, Apocalypse 20, I think, is a, a picture of post-incarnation history. It begins with the dragon being bound, Right so that he can deceive the nations no more. But then you have this thousand years uh, where, you know, those to whom judgment has been committed, the bishops, are sitting on their thrones, their cathedras, and they're ruling. But even during this period, it says that the saints are presented with the mark of the beast, which, you know, could be like the mark of Cain, this, this temptation to sin. And those who defeat it, you know, resurrect and, and reign with Christ. And most of the fathers saw this as referring to the age of the church from the incarnation to when Christ returns, the, the eschaton. Um, and so, but then it says after this, I think verse seven or eight, that this dragon is briefly unleashed again to do one final, you know, row with the church. And, and we also know from the catechism that the church teaches that as Christ individually experienced a passion, his mystical body will experience a passion. There's a great deal of typology with the passion, I think is extremely relevant to all this. So that, that'd be a much longer conversation. Um, the, the other place we see restrain, release, and return. So we see it in Apocalypse 20. We see it in 2 Thessalonians 2. We also see it in one of Christ's parables where he talks about uh, demonic possession. And he says, you know, he talks about binding the strong man and, and to, to despoil him of his goods. But then he says that the strong man will come back with seven more demons. Okay. So I think that's the same historical pattern. And, and we know that the parables, Jesus said, they're mysteries of the kingdom. So I think that parable is not only personal about the nature of possession, I personally think it's it's also related to the history of the church. We also see the same pattern again in Daniel. In Daniel 2, we hear about the establishment of the Messianic kingdom in the days of those kings, and those kings are the Roman emperors. Uh, broad and patristic consensus on that. But then in Daniel 12, which is about the end times, and, and Daniel says to the angel, when will all this be fulfilled? The angel says it will be fulfilled when the power, not the sovereignty. In Daniel 2, it says that the that the kingdom, its, its sovereignty will not be passed to another. It will last forever, whatnot. But then in Daniel 12, the angel says when the power, not the authority, not the sovereignty, but when the power of the holy people has been shattered, then all these things will be accomplished, which I think lines up with our Lord's, you know, his power in a temporal sense, at least, being shattered at the cross. You know, he this moment of apparent weakness is, is what precedes the moment of ultimate triumph. And so, yes, this pattern of restrain, release, return, 
one other one other thing I'll bring it in with Freemasonry in just a second. So Apocalypse uh, 17 or 18, I, I keep mentioning this. I keep saying 17 or 18. I just should look it up. I think it's 17. But, you know, St. John is writing the Apocalypse about 80, 90 or so. And he refers to the beast that is not, was, and will be again, which I find right. very, very interesting. I think it's that beast that is bound by the incarnation, passion, and resurrection of our Lord. And it's the system. I mean, Satan tempted our Lord with the kingdoms of this world. Okay, so if the kingdoms of this world were all of a sudden heading toward our Lord, which all the fathers talk about with the pagans, they're like, look all around you. The pagan altars are falling. The, the temples are empty. They're being replaced by the altars of Christ. So and then so here's where I'm tying in with Freemasonry. Whenever you read Freemason, uh, Freemasonic sources, occult sources, they hate the Catholic Church because they see the Catholic Church as that ultimate restraint on what they were doing on the pagan mystery systems. You know, you can read all sorts of documents from the Middle Ages of the Church, where the Church is saying, yeah, these these sorcerers, these witches, these exist. Now there's always, you know, irrational exuberance about some of these things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the real thing. You know, th there is a an alliance between the human and the, and the demonic that allows for false signs and wonders, which is exactly what Paul says will precede the coming of Antichrist. And so the Church was always dealing with that, and incidentally enough, these same church documents talk about um, some of the sources of power of these of these practices being the sacrifice of babies and abortion. Uh, they even mentioned contraception. It's very interesting. Um, so it's like Satan hates the family, you know, as as we know from Our Lady of Fatima and all sorts of things. And and so um, so yeah, I think Freemasonry and occultism sees itself as resurrecting the pagan mystery system that was ultimately restrained and suppressed by the Catholic Church. And so, I think this is a, a rebirth of that system that our Lord allows when the catacon no longer restrains and when there's a great apostasy from the, from the, of the temporal from the spiritual, which I think is happening now. This all seems deeply theological though. So is there some core coven that is directing um, the, the comings and goings and the wider agenda of Freemasonry that is like a theologically sa satanical, um, you know, theological Satanists who are actively working in league with, with, you know, the forces of the Antichrist? This all sounds so fantastical. At the same time, I, I find myself um, believing a lot of it because of just the pattern that's unfolding before our eyes and because of the power of Dylan's argument and his documentation. Yeah, I mean, Dylan claims there is. Um, and, you know, honestly, I'm not, you know, I have a lot of people who approach me, including family members who, thank God, have come into the church. Um, you know, have you seen this latest thing or this latest, con you know, this latest scandal? And my response almost always is, uh, are you reading the scripture and the fathers or scripture and the saints? You know, so I, I am personally not especially your question is a good one, by the way. So I'm not I'm not dodging it. But I I personally don't pry into all that stuff. Is there a central um, organization? Personally, I think there is. I think there is. Um, Pope Leo XIII even talks about this. He talks about um well, first of all, he says that these various Freemasonic groups had already attained something like sovereignty in multiple states, that they had, they had possessed the, um, the temporal apparatus of different countries and were already controlling them. And this is 1903. That was Anum Ingressi or whatnot, his last encyclical. Um, and I think he mentioned this in Humanum Genus as well. So, um, uh, you know, I can only take any, any point, but he points to the fact that all these formerly Christendom regimes, I guess you could say, were overturned in very similar ways. You know, uh, he talks about the involvement of the press. He talks about a similar line of conduct in, in France and Italy of despoiling the monasteries and taking, the property from the, taking property from the church. He talks about the secularizing of education, all these sorts of things. Again, over and over, it's the same game plan in every single country. And, and Pope Leo XIII and Dylan see in this strong evidence that it is, in fact... Um, to one degree or another, centrally coordinated or, or at least centrally conceived. It's I too guess. much to be coincidental, in other yeah. words. Let me, okay, so we're out of time, and this interview has just really flown by. This is fascinating stuff. Um, 
Uh, let me just end with this, give you the opportunity um, to, to speak to this. Why right now did we decide to resuscitate this work, you know, this 1885 book? Uh, why, did, why did you feel necessary to bring this forward um, as editor to add an introduction and take this idea to Tan Books, to the good people at Tan Books? One, I think the truth of the Catholic Church and faith is in one measure or another exemplified by who its enemies are. And, you know, growing up Protestant, I, you know, I heard all sorts of people make all sorts of wild claims about the church and the Vatican. You know, some of them are probably true. We know that there's horrible corruption in the church throughout history on occasion. Um, you know, and, and, and our Lord warned about it, the apostles warned about it. So, one, by virtue of the fact, so showing people that Freemasonry and occultism has always identified the Catholic Church as its number one enemy, and that should be an indicate indicative of where we should all, you know, be. Um, second, um, I hope it honestly can help switch the Overton window a bit. As I said earlier, I think the two extremes are all talk of this is just, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy theory theorizing, which is false. But there's also this whole kind of ostrich in the head, uh, uh, ostrich head in the ground uh, sort of approach of no, 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 there's nothing going wrong, you know. Uh, and, th and that's not true either. I, in my introduction, I quote uh, Robert Moynihan, who's a great scholar who lives in Rome, uh, or at least he has in Rome, and he was good friends with, uh, then at the time, Cardinal Ratzinger. And just prior to him becoming Pope, I recount a conversation. And ironically, Moynihan posted this during the lockdowns when I was reading this book, and I saw it. It was posted in April 2020. And he, he asked Ratzinger, what's the single greatest threat to the church? And he said Ratzinger, in his normal, very pensive way, just sort of quietly pondered it and then looked right at him and said, it's Freemasonry. Right. And, wow. and, and, wow. and so, so, and again, what does that ultimately mean? Does it mean the nice guys at the, oh, no, it, it, I really do think it is this naturalism, this solo natura, this, this um, removal of the transcendent dimension from everything in human life. Sure. You know, well, and which is what I think the world economic forum, I mean, most Western elites kind of operate from, capitalism in the West has become as materialistic and godless as, in many ways as communism was in the East. Right. Right. I, I prefer what we have. Don't get me wrong. I do. But, but, but it has, it has, it's, it's, you know, it's atomizing individuals. It's destroying families. It's making us dopamine addicts that just want to go from one material pleasure to the next. Um, and which we can get immediately through Amazon and all and Netflix and binging on this, that, and the other. You know, it, it's yeah. So it's the it's the desacralization, the the demystifying, the detranscendentalizing of all human life. Well, thank you so much, uh, yeah. Josh Charles. Everybody, you guys can buy the book from from Tan Books. Uh, great work, and you know, I'm a thank perennial you, skeptic, and I was largely uh, convinced by by Dylan's work. Thank you so much. There you go. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. God bless.